one very good way to understand who is a true Christian is to understand this great truth of deliverance. If you understand deliverance, you will understand this issue. You can know who a true Christian is because they've been delivered. How would your life change if you had a near-death experience? Would you see each new day as a gift? Would you worry less? Would you spend more time with family and less time at work? Well, if you're a Christian, do you realize that until God saved you, you were not just near death, but you actually were dead. You were a spiritual corpse, and God made you alive, delivering you from the eternal consequences of your sin. So how should that deliverance affect the way you live your life both today and in the future? Consider that now on Grace to You as John MacArthur continues his study called Delivered by God. Evangelicalism is in a desperate situation, and that desperation is made manifest by its inability to distinguish who is a true Christian. We have abandoned any clear understanding of what it means to really be saved. We, in the sense of broad evangelicalism. This kind of evangelicalism pervades today, and it's being systematically developed and spread. And people are reluctant to call it what it is because you're viewed as unloving. And I have to ask the question, is the gospel that unclear? Is it that fuzzy? Is it that hard to understand the gospel? Is the New Testament not clear on the subject? Does it not give us enough light to know who is a Christian and what it means to be in the body of Christ and what is necessary to go to heaven? I mean, doesn't the Bible say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Doesn't the Bible say that if anybody doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, He's cursed? Doesn't the Bible say that salvation is by faith and, com and faith comes by hearing the Word of God and hearing the Word about Christ? And how are they going to hear without a preacher? And how are they going to have a preacher unless somebody goes? Are we really supposed to call all the missionaries home? Are we really supposed to stop evangelizing because anybody anywhere who thinks good thoughts about God and tries to be a little different than his society is going to be in heaven? We're cutting the heart out of the church here and out of our ministry. If the New Testament, on the other hand, does settle the issue, then we have no right to ignore the New Testament. We have no right to redefine it on our own terms in order to be popular in order to be accepted. True and historic Christianity has never been confused about what it means to be a Christian, never. True and historic Christianity has always known that the New Testament is crystal clear on this issue. The New Testament tells us everything we need to know so as to be unmistakably certain as to what it is that a person must believe to be saved. There is no lack of information in order to discern. There is no lack of information, truth, in order to distinguish between true and false, nominal and real Christians. And we have said that one very good way to understand who is a true Christian is to understand this great truth of deliverance. If you understand deliverance, you will understand this issue. You can know who a true Christian is because they've been delivered they've been delivered. And first of all, they've been delivered from error to what? The truth. Nobody is a Christian who doesn't believe the truth about Christ. Muslims don't believe the truth about Christ. Buddhists don't. Non-believers don't. Mormons don't. Pagans in tribes don't. If they have a heart that seeks God, if the Spirit is prompting their heart, believe me, God will deliver that truth about Christ to them so they can believe. But apart from that, there's no salvation. There isn't salvation in any other name, is there? Anybody who's a believer 
has come to know the truth, understand the truth, believe the truth, embrace the truth, and love that truth, and reject everything else as a means of salvation. One thing can be said about a Christian. He knows the truth. He loves the truth. He worships the God of truth, exalts the Christ of truth, is indwelt by the Spirit of truth, and obeys the Word of truth. Truth is the heart and soul of the gospel that saves. Transformation begins with a transformation out of darkness into light. Darkness is a metaphor in Colossians 1, 12 and 13 for error, and light is the metaphor for truth. You can tell a true Christian. A true Christian knows the truth, understands the truth, loves the truth, lives for the truth. Nobody is saved who doesn't. That's the truth about who God is. The Trinity, holy, the eternal sovereign of the universe, who Christ is, God incarnate in human flesh who lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, though He was innocent of any sin, rose the third day in a physical resurrection, having conquered death, ascended to heaven from where He sent the Holy Spirit, now interceding for us someday to return and establish His eternal glory and kingdom. And to believe that salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone apart from any works. It doesn't matter that you're trying to be a little better than the people around you. That's the truth. And apart from that truth, nobody's saved. And if somebody's a Christian, they know that truth, they understand that truth, they believe that truth, they embrace that truth. Secondly, Christians have not only been delivered from error to truth, but from sin to righteousness. Remember in Romans 6, go back there for a moment, Romans 6, 17 and 18 is a very critical verse because it captures the essence of this deliverance doctrine. Romans 6, 17, middle of the verse, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were delivered, is what the Greek says. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, that body of doctrine, that body of truth to which you were delivered. That was your salvation. You went out of the darkness into the light, out of error into truth. You from the depth of your heart obeyed that doctrine, that body of teaching regarding Jesus Christ and the gospel. You believed that. You were delivered into that. Now go back to the beginning of the verse. So, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, drop down to verse 18, you have been freed from sin, become slaves of righteousness. The second thing from which you were delivered, not just from error to truth, but from sin to righteousness. There's another element of uh, deliverance. The Christian has been delivered from the temporal world to the eternal kingdom. The Christian has been delivered from the temporal world to the eternal kingdom. Listen to Galatians 1, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, I stole the name of our radio program from Paul, grace to you. Verse 4, who gave Himself for our sins, here it comes, that He might deliver us out of this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forevermore, amen. That's a great... That's a great doxology, isn't it? We have been delivered out of this present evil age into the eternal kingdom. By the way, this is what we call a Greek subjunctive, which indicates purpose. The purpose for which Jesus died was to deliver us out of this present evil I own. That's what is inherent in His salvation. The very purpose of our salvation was to deliver us out of this present evil age. The word age is I own. It doesn't refer to time, but it refers to a system, an era. And the present evil age started at the fall, and it'll go on until Jesus comes back and establishes His kingdom of righteousness. In between the fall and the establishment of the kingdom of Christ is this present evil age. It is characterized by lies, it is characterized by deception, it is characterized by Satan's agenda, it is characterized by what is temporal, what is for time only, what is physical, what is passing, what ultimately will be destroyed. And the Lord rescued us from that. 
Another way to say it is over in the sixth chapter of Galatians. Look at that, 6 verse 14. He's sort of talking here about how the Pharisees boasted in their works, were proud about their self-righteousness. And Paul is not like the circumcised who boast about their fastidious attention to the law. Verse 14, he says, "'May it never be that I should boast.'" I'm not going to boast about anything in me. I don't have anything worthy in me. But if I do boast, I will boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what did that cross accomplish? Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What does it mean to be crucified? To be dead. It's just a dramatic way to express the thought of death. Paul says, Jesus Christ went to the cross and through His work on the cross, the world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. What does it mean? It simply means that the world has no relation to the believer and the believer has no real relation to the world. And what we mean by world here is not food and sunshine and, uh, and, and just the normal matters of life which God has given us, but He's talking here about ideas and ideologies and thought patterns and values and honors and achievements and accomplishments and all the stuff that everybody is into. The pleasures, the treasures, the honors, the values, the ideas. If you go back to 2 Corinthians 10, 5, a very important passage, he talks about the, the uh, ideologies, the logismos. Paul says, we are destroying ideologies, and then he further describes them as every lofty thing lifted up or exalted against the knowledge of God, any anti-God idea. Any anti-God idea. Look at Colossians 2. Just a thought in verse 20. Since you have died with Christ, would be a better way to translate it. Since you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world. Stop right there. Hey, when you died with Christ, you died to the, the elementary... And I love that because what he's saying is anything the world comes up with compared to the truth of God is elementary. It's baby talk. We are the truly profound people. We have transcendent truth. The, the most literate PhDs, the most brilliant philosophers and thinkers of our time, elementary school compared to what we know. We know the origin of the universe. We know how it came into existence. We know who made it and why he made it. We know how it's all going to end. We know what true understanding is. We, we died to that baby talk, that elementary stuff. One other passage and I'll close, 1 John 2. This will be the last text we'll look at, 1 John 2, and it's brief. Well, one more brief one added to that, but <laughs> just, it'll only take a comment or two. 1 John 2, verse 15. World is the word cosmos, it's the uh, opposite of the word chaos. Chaos means disorder in Greek as it does in English. Cosmos means order, that's why we call them cosmetics. They sort of take the chaos and put it into order. <laughs> I didn't invent the word, that's the word. But cosmos is the order. It's the present evil age system. It's a system, uh, an exalted system of ideas and theories and viewpoints and values and honors and treasures and pleasures that have been designed by Satan and uh, appeal to the sinful. In verse 15, he says, do not love the world, this cosmos, this present evil I own, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is what? If you love it, you're not, you're not a Christian. You can't, you can't love the world and love God. I enjoy God's creation. I see it as His handiwork, don't you? I don't look at the mountains and say, isn't evolution amazing? I don't look at a baby and say, thank God for that amoeba one day in a pool of something or other that decided to split. Thank God for natural selection. I heard a person say that, thank God for natural selection. 
But when I see a person, I see a creation of God. I see a person made in the image of God. When I see a mountain, I see the handiwork of God. And the heavens declare His glory, don't they? The firmament shows His handiwork. And I enjoy the world, and I enjoy what He's made, and I enjoy the wonderful, rich pleasures that He's placed in the world, but it's all Him to me. It's all Him. He's in every flower. He's in every hill. He's in every pleasure. He's in every everything. His hand is there. I love Him, and I love His world because, as the hymn writer said, this is my Father's world. But if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. If your love is this passing world, you're not a Christian. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. You have two different people here. You have the people that love God and live forever, and you have the people that love the world which is going to burn. We don't love the world. We've been delivered from it. My. My life is not consumed with what happens in this world. Frankly, my life is consumed with what ha happens in the next world. In Colossians 3, I've set my affection on things where? Above and not on things on the earth. The things on the earth are simply things which for this time and place give glory to God and I can enjoy them and thank Him for them, but they have no lasting value. They are temporal expressions of His common grace and His love. We don't love the world, first of all, because of what it is. It is the world. It is Satan's system. We don't love it because of what it does. It incites to sin. Satan uses the world to pander to our flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. It passes its material pleasures, its sexual pleasures, its educational achievements, its honors, its accolades, its power its philosophies in front of us, it enamors us, and it draws out our sensuality, our covetousness, and our pride. Those are ascending categories of temptation. Sensuality is the corruption of the lower being, abuse of the body. Covetousness is a corruption of the higher being, abuse of beauty that turns to covetousness. Pride is the corruption of the highest being, and that is self-exaltation where we become God. And the world panders to that. We don't love it because it is the world, and we don't love it because of what it is, and we don't love it because of what it does. It just panders to our fallenness. We don't love it also because of where it's going. Verse 17, it's passing away. It's in the process of paragetai, disintegration. The system is in the process of dissolution. It will self-destruct. It is self-destructing. And the death principle is already operative in it. It is smitten by the fatal disease of sin that is killing it. And people always say, it seems like things are getting worse and worse. We've got to reclaim America. Look, folks, things are getting worse and worse, and they will continue to get worse and worse. That's the accumulative impact of sin. It is smitten by a fatal disease that is killing it. That's why 1 Corinthians 7.31, Paul writes that the form of this world is passing away. But we are part of a kingdom, end of verse 17, that abides how long? Forever. Our affections are set on things above. That's how you can tell a Christian. One last look at 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4, for whatever or whoever is born of God. I love this, overcomes what? The world. The world no longer has that attraction. And what is a victory that has overcome the world? Our faith. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, and He delivered you from this present evil age, this world, in, uh, delivered you from this temporal world into the eternal kingdom. You have overcome the world. And who is the one, verse 5, that overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Look, folks, you can't overcome the world, which is the mark of a Christian, unless you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You can't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God unless somebody tells you about Jesus. Nobody is a Christian who doesn't know the truth, because the only way that you can ever be delivered from this world into the eternal kingdom is to believe the truth about Jesus Christ. If you don't believe the truth about Jesus Christ, you can't be delivered. And we're right back to where we started. 
That's why we have to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, because it is the only way of salvation. We are the overcomers. We are, the, the word is Nike, from which the word Nike comes. It's the Greek word for overcomer, victor, conqueror. And one of the things that our faith conquers is the system of evil dominated by lust and pride, sensuality, covetousness, and egotism. We are not sensual in practice. We are not covetous in practice. You know, greed is good in the world, and sensuality is good in the world, and, and egotism is really good. But to us, those are sins, aren't they? This society running in a mad dash for every sexual fulfillment with materialistic passion, coveting and clinging to everything they can see turning beauty into self-indulgence and in the midst of it all doing everything they can to elevate their self-esteem. That's the world and that's sin, but we have overcome the world so that we see that for what it is and our passion is that which honors God and our self-assessment is that of humility and when we see something beautiful, we give Him praise for it. We are the overcomers. In fact, uh, in Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the churches, seven times believers are referred to as overcomers. Well, how can there be so much confusion about who's a Christian? Christians have been delivered from error to truth. They've come to the full understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. From sin to righteousness, they live in obedience to the Word of God as a practice. And they've been delivered from this present evil age, this system of Satan, into the eternal kingdom. Their affections are heavenly, their desire is for that which is eternal and not for the passing things of this world. This is God's truth and this must be proclaimed, that He may be glorified and people may come to true salvation and to the praise of God for that gift. Let's pray. We close these thoughts with a plea, Father, first that You would extend the truth and that it would conquer the lies, that You would extend the truth and it would conquer the error, that it would unmask the deception that is leaving so many souls confused and hindering the true work of evangelism. And Father, that You would raise up many faithful proclaimers of the truth and that You would call away from error all those who have fallen victim to it. May people have the, the truth. And may they have the courage to speak the truth because it honors you, the God of truth, and our Savior, the Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the blessed Spirit of truth, who inspired for us the Word of truth. May your truth be exalted. Your Word, may it be exalted even to your own name. And may deception be exposed that people might indeed be delivered from error from sin and from this passing world. And we will thank you and praise you for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. This is Grace to You with John MacArthur. Thanks for being with us. John's been our featured speaker for over 54 years now. He's also Chancellor of the Master's University and Seminary, and our current series that examines the blessings of salvation is titled, Delivered by God. Now, John, you talked today about the world system and how it's designed by Satan. So a question along that line, in areas where we might see satanic influence, maybe government, academia, or the entertainment industry, does Satan exercise direct control? Does he call the shots in all the evil that's in the world today? Well, the answer to that question is, um, is both yes and no. If Satan wasn't here, the world would still be full of evil. In fact, in the future, millennial kingdom, Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and there will develop in the world an entire worldwide population of people. Now remember, Satan and his demons aren't there, but there will develop a worldwide population of people who will attempt at the end of the kingdom of Christ to overthrow him and fight him, and they will be destroyed. So that's because human nature is fallen. Human nature is corrupt. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
And uh, man's nature is marked by lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And you don't need the devil for that. So, in one sense, if if the devil isn't around, the world is still going to be corrupt. There's going to be evil everywhere. What Satan brings to the picture is he structures that evil. He formulates that evil. He motivates that evil. He escalates that evil. He, He develops that evil into religious systems that are false and damning. He develops it into philosophies views of the world, psychologies, etc., etc., evolution, a godless view of the way things are. So Satan is a wily, wise, crafty angel of light, at least that he wants you to think that he is, designing the systems of the world. He oversees the systems in which the fallen creatures play out their sin. So in the sense that... Uh, we describe it that way, not every act of evil in the world is directly influenced by Satan. They are acts of the flesh. But the overarching system, yes, governments, yes, institutions, uh, academia, entertainment, whatever, they are directly under his influence as he orchestrates his own ends with his demon assistance. The whole world, wrote John, lies in the lap of the evil one in that sense. And another way to look at it is, Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, you're of your father, the devil. You either belong to the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of God. You're either under the rule of God or the rule of Satan. Thank you, John. And friend, to help you understand what Satan and his demons can and cannot do, Let me recommend John's book, Standing Strong. It will show you how to resist the enemy of your soul effectively and biblically. Order a copy of Standing Strong when you contact us today. Call 800-55-GRACE or go to gty.org to order. Again, the title to ask for, Standing Strong. Take a look at the origins of spiritual warfare and how it's being waged today and what role you play in the battle. Our order number again, 855-GRACE and our web address, gty.org. And friend, if John's verse-by-verse teaching, like today's lesson from Delivered by God, has helped you and your family better understand what the Lord Jesus Christ has saved you from, If you've seen your family spiritually strengthened, or if God has used this ministry to draw someone you know to faith in Christ, we would love to hear from you. You can reach us by mail, Grace to You, Box 4000, Panorama City, California, 91412, or even quicker, email us at letters at gty.org. That's our email address, letters at gty.org. And thanks for contacting this radio station when you're able. Let the team here at this station know that you appreciate hearing Bible teaching programs like Grace to You. Now for John MacArthur, I'm Phil Johnson, encouraging you to be here at the same time tomorrow when John looks at how to effectively communicate the truth about Christ to an unbelieving world. It's another 30 minutes of unleashing God's truth one verse at a time on Grace to You. And Judas has given them a sign, verse 48, he who was betraying him gave them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one sees him. There's some profound anger in that. There's some profound bitterness in that. There's hatred in that. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kept on kissing Him, kissed Him repeatedly. And Jesus said to him, Friend, and it's not the word for friend that is most used to refer to that. It's not the kind of friend that you think of as an intimate friend. It's the word for associate or comrade. It's a more indifferent word. It's a more distant word. Uh, Comrade or associate, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. It's really unbelievable 
what Judas has done. Verse 57 says, When they had seized him, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. They were gathered together in this phony trial with false accusations. They tried to bribe witnesses to lie about Him, verse 59, trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they could have a reason to put Him to death. They couldn't get people who could get their story together, though many people tried because they would be paid if they could. Finally, some people came along and said He was going to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days, which He said at the beginning of His ministry. And uh, this mock trial went from the high priest to Herod to Pilate, and it, you know all the phases of that trial. The final adjudication, the high priest, verse 65, tears his robes. He's blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And here's the final verdict on Jesus. He deserves to die. They sentence him to death. It's the death penalty. Then they spat in his face, beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said mockingly, of course, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? That's the outcome of what Judas did. That's the outcome for Jesus of His betrayal. But what about Judas? Go down to chapter 27. When morning came and the phony trial went through the night, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put Him to death, bound Him, led Him away, and delivered Him to Pilate who was the governor, head of the Roman force, who would be the executioners. And then we read concerning Judas in verse 3. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away and hanged himself. And then the chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it's not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since it's the price of blood, so they bought a burial place for strangers. The horrible tragedy of Judas, hell forever, damned. Jesus said He went to His own place. Judas is the greatest tragedy in human history because of the opportunity that he squandered. Because of unparalleled privilege, he is the ultimate in wasted opportunity. Greedy, a materialist, a money lover, earthy, full of avarice, greed, motivated by a desire for riches and self-promotion. These things in him were so strong and so powerful and so overwhelming that they smothered the reality of who he was with for three years. So strong was his sinful heart in its self-love that he ignored the truth, the unmistakable glory of Christ, and went to hell on purpose. He went to hell on purpose. You might say he loved himself too much, he rejected salvation too often, and he resented Christ too strongly. He had seen the most powerful demonstration of deity ever unleashed in this world. The glory of God displayed in Jesus. And this is where he ended up. What a waste. What an end. Now I want to go back and I want to look at Peter, the second person, second preacher, second disciple. So let's go back to chapter 26 and pick up the story. In verse 30, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And in verse 31, Jesus makes an amazing statement, you will all stumble, you will all trip up, you will all fall away because of Me this night. For it is written, and He quotes Zechariah 13, 7, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. You're all going to defect. You're all going to fall. You will all be literally offended. You'll all have a kind of tacit denial, tacit betrayal. 
Now we don't have the record that the ten in between Peter and Judas actually denied Jesus verbally, publicly, openly. They just ran and hid. But then He says in verse 32, "'After I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee,' which means that their defection was temporary and they would all be brought back together again. Theirs would be a temporary stumbling, a temporary falling, temporary defection. Not like Judas. His was forever. Well, this gives Peter the opportunity to boast. Verse 33, Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Never. He's adamant, confident. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Rooster crows around 3 a.m. in the morning. You're going to deny me three times before a rooster crow. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. What a profession. As it turned out, Peter was overconfident. Jesus had warned him, you're going to deny me. You who said on another occasion, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the same one who also said, no, 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 Lord, you're not going to die. And at that moment, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You with all the best theology, you with all the best of intentions, you're, you're going to fail and you're going to fail dramatically. You're going to be ashamed of me, you're going to deny me, you're going to betray me. And sure enough, it happened. Go to verse 69. Uh, Jesus is taken to the house of the high priest, trials going on. Peter sitting outside in the courtyard. Servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, he heads for the door to get away from the, the fire because it lightens his face and he hides into the darkness a little bit. But another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it, this time with an oath. I don't know the man. He's lying and he's taking an oath that he's telling the truth when he knows he's lying. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you two are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. You have a Galilean accent. We hear it. This is amazing. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. The trial went through the night at the time when the rooster would crow early before dawn. The signal was given on schedule right after Peter on three occasions, in three locations, to different people had betrayed Jesus. Judas couldn't deal with the guilt of his betrayal. He felt remorse. He felt guilt. He felt sadness, sorrow that was so overwhelming that he killed himself. Now, that's serious. When you commit suicide under the weight of guilt, you feel the guilt profoundly. What about Peter? Did he kill himself? Done the same thing? Hadn't done it for money, but he'd done it. In a sense, he was saying, this isn't the Christ. This, he was giving them the same attitude that Judas gave them when he was willing to sell Jesus. But verse 75 says, Peter remembered the words which Jesus had said, before a cock crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and wept bitterly. He didn't kill himself. He just went out and wept. Something happened in that moment you need to know about. In the middle of Peter's denial, as his denial was coming to its end, 
Luke 22:61 says this. Now they're in the courtyard of the high priest. Peter's milling around there in the shadows. Jesus is there being tried. Peter's kept his distance. But it says in Luke 22:61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Eyeball to eyeball. When Judas and Jesus' eyes met in the darkness of Gethsemane, Judas kissed Him with a kiss of hate, the kiss of a hypocrite. When the eyes of Peter met the eyes of Jesus, he was crushed, he was shattered, he was devastated, and broke down in genuine tears of true repentance. Crushing sadness led Judas to suicide without repentance. Crushing sadness led Peter to restoration with repentance. And the difference was the way they looked at Christ, the way they responded to Christ. For Peter, the vision of Christ drew him to repentance. For Judas, the vision of Christ drew him to suicide. You might say, for Peter, the vision of Christ drew him to heaven. For Judas, the vision of Christ drew him to hell. What was the difference? Peter loved Jesus Christ. He loved Him. After the resurrection in Galilee, according to John 21, Jesus found Peter. He found him fishing, which he shouldn't have been doing, but he was. And he had breakfast with him by the shore of the lake. And he said this to Peter, Peter, do you what? Do you love me? That's always the question, folks. That's the question. Don't get too complicated about what it means to be a Christian. It means you love Christ. That's what it means. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Oh, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my lambs. A few moments later, Peter, do you really love me? And Peter was grieved because he said the third time, do you love me? And what was Peter's response? Lord, you know my heart. You know I love you. There is so much simplicity in that. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is the difference between Judas and Peter? Love for Christ. Love for Christ. That's the difference. That's the message of Christianity. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. You're mine, do my work based on the fact that you love me. How you feel about Christ, how you view Him will determine your heaven or your hell. Peter was a betrayer and we can see how it happened. He boasted too much. He prayed too little. He acted too fast, drew out a sword and wanted to make a war. He followed too far. He stayed off in the shadows. So you can say, yeah, there were some factors in overconfidence and lack of prayer and impulsiveness and cowardice. But Peter was no final disaster. He was no final disaster. Grace was operating in Peter's life. Grace was not operating in Judas' life. Grace was operating in Peter's life because Peter loved Jesus Christ. And John tells us in 1 John 4, we love Him because He first loved us. Jesus had set His love on Peter and Peter loved Him in return. They had a relationship of love. That is the deep and compelling attitude of the true believer. It comes down to this, the true believer's love for Christ is the evidence of salvation. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Paul says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be damned. It comes to that. You look at Christianity, you look at the church, and, and you can get very complicated about uh, what it means to be a Christian. It's this simple. Look at your heart. Do you love Christ? Do you seek His honor, seek His glory? Does your heart go out in affection toward Him? Do you desire to please Him, exalt Him, love Him, worship Him, commune with Him, hear Him, 
I'll sum it up. If you love Me, John 14, you keep My what? Commandments. You love His Word. You love Him. That's how love acts. That was Peter. Back in John 6, many of the disciples who didn't love Jesus but hung around left. John 6 says many of His disciples walked no more with Him. And then Jesus said, uh, do you also want to go away? Do you also want to leave? And Peter says, to whom will we go? You and you alone of the words of life. We don't want to go. We want to stay because you give us the words of life. He loved His Lord and He loved the truth that His Lord conveyed. Love desires to know the truth and obey the truth. Peter was secure because he had a love relationship with Christ. You remember back in Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan desires to have you, that he, can, that he might sift you like wheat. Satan desires to have you. He, he's come and asked permission to go after you. He's going to sift you like wheat. But when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. What was the guarantee that He would be converted, that He would survive that? Jesus said this one line, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. He secures His own by His own intercessory prayer. The Lord loved Peter. Peter loved the Lord. The Lord kept Peter even in the midst of a terrible betrayal. Peter was restored, recommissioned, and became the great gospel preacher in the first era of the church. From the beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 2, where he preaches on Pentecost, he's the dominating preacher for the first twelve chapters of Acts, the history of the church. Now l let me say something that, that uh, is very important at this point. Sin and guilt do not produce true repentance. Sin and guilt do not produce true repentance. They may produce remorse. They may produce regret. They may produce sorrow and sadness, and it can even be so severe that it's deadly. People kill themselves because they can't bear the consequences of their evil. But sin and guilt do not produce true repentance. The horror of Judah's sin didn't make him repent. Listen. And the horror of Peter's sin didn't make him repent. And the ugliness of your sin and the weight of your guilt will not make you repent. It is not enough to make a sinner repent. It is enough to make you sad and full of remorse and make you try to undo it and even make you kill yourself. But it's not enough to bring you to true repentance. What makes the sinning, guilt-ridden soul repent is seeing and loving Christ. Seeing and loving Christ. Christ becomes all in all, a source of grace and salvation. Peter loved the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed in Him with all his heart. He believed that He was the Son of God. Yes, He went through a terrible trial, horrible failure, epic disaster. But when His eyes met the eyes of Jesus in the deep night of that trial, He was crushed, not into suicide, but He was crushed into repentance because He loved Christ. This is the mind of the saved soul. It's about loving Christ. Do you love Christ? Peter gives a personal testimony when he writes his epistle. He says this in chapter 1, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls." Peter had lived that. He had lived through an unbelievable trial, a disastrous failure, and in the midst of that, 
He had seen Christ, and Christ had given Him a look of love, restored Him, recommissioned Him, used Him mightily. Peter says, you who haven't seen Him, you also love Him. And because of that, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, knowing you're going to receive the outcome of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So two men, two students, two preachers, indistinguishable to their close friends, one is a suicide, one is a saint, one is in hell, one is in heaven. Both betrayed Jesus in very, very adamant public ways, both at the same time in the same kinds of circumstances. Similarities are many, but no two men could be further apart, further separated than these two. Judas, for whom Jesus was a disappointment, whom He resented if not hated. Peter, for whom Jesus was a Savior, whom He loved. Judas was a devil who went to his own place the place He deserved. Peter was a saint who went to the place prepared for Him, the place He did not deserve. Because in the end, Judas belonged to Satan, and Peter belonged to Jesus. It's all about loving Christ, and that's how you know your spiritual condition. A benediction, Ephesians 6.24. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Let me read that again. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Do you love Him? Do you love Him so that you long to honor Him, to please Him, to exalt Him, to lift up His name? to obey His Word, to proclaim Him. That's the mark of a true believer. Father, we ask that You would be merciful and gracious to us, as You always are to sinners who repent. We would ask that there, if there are any here who are in the category of Judas who have been experiencing maybe for a long time, maybe for years, the same experiences with all the rest. But they're going to end up separated from You and from all who belong to You forever in eternal punishment because there's no love for Christ. Give them a vision of Christ. Why do we preach Christ? constantly, relentlessly, year after year after year. Why? Because it's the vision of Christ that saves. It's the lifting up of Christ that draws men. May Christ become all glorious, all wondrous, desirable, beautiful, magnificent, the desire of every heart. And for those of us who do love Him and who stumble and fail, thank You for the grace that is continually extended to us. We confess that we don't love Him as we should, but we long to love Him more. We would desire to love with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Falling short of that, we ask for grace and forgiveness for our failures, failure to love. If we could love perfectly in that, there would be the keeping of the whole law. Would You, by Your power, by the working of the Holy Spirit in us, and by exposure to the truth in Holy Scripture, increase our love for Christ. May He be all in all to us. Father, we ask that You would work Your work in our hearts. To proclaim the truth is only the beginning. You have to do the work of making the truth bear fruit in hearts, and we pray, Lord, that You would do that this day. We thank You for the blessed time of praise and exaltation and worship which lifted our souls. and. We also thank You for the time of self-examination because we've been instructed to examine ourselves whether we be in the faith. And may that honest examination go on. And for those who know You, for the Peters in this congregation, may there be joy unspeakable, inexpressible, and full of glory as we celebrate Your grace toward us in Christ. Increase our love for Him. 
we pray in his wonderful name. Amen.